Okay, picking up where we left off on page uh, 140, we're talking about this data flow diagram. And the whole point of a data flow diagram is it shows how the system stores, processes, and transforms data. So it's a very data-centric view. Now, it's not the entire process. Uh, typically, you would not use a data flow diagram for the entire system. It would only the systems, the part of the system that, you know, has significant data. Uh, so, it, again, if you're a database guy and you got, you're on the team and you're putting together uh, um, a, an application that's going to be using a database, you, you being the database guy, you're going to want to see this diagram more than anyone else. And unfortunately, it is one of the ones that's it's a little complex. Uh, the next one on page 141 is the use case diagrams. And it's the one that's the most abstract. The one that is most foreign to most people. Um, it has a little stick figures and some few other odds and ends. And, if, and we're going to be spending an awful lot of time uh, doing uh, UML diagrams using this. But um, it basically shows, instead of just data, it shows the interaction between the, the humans and what goes on. So, you know, a customer comes in and a customer does this and does do that. So it, it does... It does show how where the customers touch the system or where the users touch the system. And that's a, a great way of making sure that you didn't miss anything. Um, so again, uh, these modeling tools are kind of sort of for you. Um, they're kind of sort of for chapter seven, you know, where the, pur the purpose for the, the modeling tool is to kind of help you with the development. Um, but right now, uh, we're not talking about the development piece. Okay, on page 143, they talk about a sequence diagram. And this is useful if what you're doing is time dependent or you're trying to make sure that things happen in the correct order. Uh, this type of a diagram uh, doesn't, doesn't tell you anything at all about, um, you know, what has to happen before something else. And so the sequence diagram is often, if there's a complex thing, now if it's something simple like, you know, order fulfillment kind of thing, you know, step one, you you fill out your shopping cart and step two it calculates the total cost and step three it calculates shipping and you know step four it asks you for you know your credit card information blah 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 uh, those steps are relatively straightforward and I probably wouldn't bother to do a sequence diagram for that because they're just linear and it's it's fairly you know it does it's not complex to, to understand but I would use a sequence diagram well, there's things running behind the scenes and, you know, certification and authorization has to take place. You know, you're building a financial application and you're doing a, a deposit transaction against an account. And behind the scenes, it says, OK, before we do this deposit, I need to verify that the user has the authority, that the account number is valid and, uh, you know, the action is authorized and I need to lock the database. Uh, and while the database lock, I'm going to perform that add function and then I'm going to release the lock. Now those are extremely important sequences that have to have to occur in the right order. And when you draw those out, the developer is going to look at that and go, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. Now, showing that to a user, uh, they're going to look at that and go, uh, what's the database lock? And it's like, ah. So again, when you get to the sequence diagrams, they generally fall in two categories. Too simple, that their usefulness is reduced. Too complex, so that the user can't help you. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. Okay, uh, on page 143 again, they talk about um, the system requirements checklist. And they have some examples. And I, I'm not going to read through a bunch of these things, but let's just, let's just go through some output examples, as, as just imagine. Talks about, you know, website must be uh, report online volume statistics every four hours and hourly during peak periods. That's a good example. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, input examples on the next page. You know, manufacturing employees must swipe their ID cards into online data collection terminals that record labor costs. Yep. Uh, process examples. You know, a student record system must calculate the GPA at the end of the semester. Yeah, okay, cool. Performance examples. You know, the system must uh, support up to 25 users concurrently. Now, that's a good uh, requirements checklist. Control examples. The system must provide logon security at the, 
at the operating system level and at the application level. That's a good one. In fact, a lot of people, you know, one of the first choices you might want to make in, in a designing an application that has security is um, if you're running on a LAN, uh, you have a choice. Do I want to use built-in security so that I just grab the user's identity and security from Microsoft itself? Or do I want to create my own set of users and passwords uh, that the guy would use? And l most people have gone away uh, from having a gazillion uh, different user and IDs and passwords. You, you know how frustrating that is in the, in the web-based world where you... You know, you routinely go to five different websites, and so you get five different usernames and five different passwords, and you have no choice but to write them all down. Well, anyway, one of those choices you can have, you know, particularly in a LAN environment, not necessarily web, is, um, you know, where do I want to put the security boundaries? And that's a, a critical step. Anyway, so we're just listing the, the system requirements checklist as an example. Okay, on page 145, uh, they talk about future growth, costs, and benefits. And the first one they talk about is scalability. And um, I have seen this. For example, um, we had a server that was uh, we were gonna we we're gonna migrate over to uh, another server. You know, all the files we we're gonna migrate over. And so I wrote this cool little program that basically all it did was um, create um, a database of the directory structure. You know, like you had done a DIR at the top of the directory structure, you know, with slash S, and it, it listed every single file and every single directory. Well, that's basically what it did, but it, but this was a, a giant server, right? So, you know, putting it in a text file or an Excel spreadsheet or something would be you know, ludicrous. So I dumped it into a Microsoft Access uh, or a SQL Server database. And um, I liked it because I could, before copying the files over to the new server, uh, you can go through and say, well, we don't need that, or maybe we ought to move this, this directory structure over here. It allowed us to kind of do what-if drills. Anyway, the point of the story is that um, we used to run it about once a month because um, we wanted to see how things were changing, and I could I could do change detection over time. I could say, well, you know, show me a directory that nobody's added to at all, and, you know, that kind of things. Okay, now, they said, that's a great tool. Um let's use that on all of our file servers. And I went, uh, it produces a four gigabyte uh, table in Microsoft uh, SQL Server. There's no way in hell I can expand this to the other servers. Not unless you buy me another SQL Server or some more disks. So it was not scalable at all. It was basically at its limit from the design. And so we basically had to tell them, uh, sorry, you know, it's going to cost you money. Sorry, I didn't think about it, but, you know. Anyway, so scalability is big business. So, uh, kind of the definition, you know, the system's ability to handle increased business volume and transactions in the future. And a scalable system offers better return on investment. Uh, because if you know in advance that you're going to be, you know, adding more servers onto this goofy little application, as an example, um, you'd say, well, when we price the system, here's what... Uh, the next set of uh, disks are going to cost you, and uh, you don't necessarily have to buy them now. But here's here's what you need to buy when it comes time to do it. And to evaluate scalability, you need information about the projected volumes for all everything. You know, the output, the input, the processing, all those things we just talked about. You need some way of predicting what that is, which of course is tough. Okay, total cost of ownership on page I one forty five and beyond. It talks about first of all the definition. You know, it's the it's basically the the full cost, the loaded cost for your new system. Uh, Microsoft uses TCO a lot in their advertising, saying, you know, for example, when well, they'll talk about you know comparing a free and open source version like Linux or one of the other alternatives to Microsoft Office, uh, Microsoft will say, yeah, it's free, but the total cost of ownership is going to be high. And they're talking about the support staff and all the things that have to happen to make this thing work. It's not just purchasing the hardware and the software. It's the total cost of doing the thing. Okay. So total cost of ownership is especially important if the development team is uh, evaluating several alternatives. If you're doing several, you know, 
different techniques or hardware or software you need to kind of know. Uh, for example, uh, when developing a database, uh, I can buy, I, I can go open source, I can go, you know, MySQL, I can go Microsoft's, you know, SQL Server and pay one time, or I could go Oracle and pay an annual fee. Uh, it's kind of my choice, you know, nothing, one time, and annual fee. So yes, total cost of ownership has to be part of the equation. And um, part of the problem is that a lot of the the cost estimates tend to underestimate those indirect costs. I mean, for example, you know, what's what type of training is going to be required? What kind of a customer support do I need? Um, and a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, we already got five guys doing that for a living, so it won't cost us anything. And then they come to find out that, no, they actually have to hire two more people. Okay. And uh, there is this rapid economic justification term that they talk about. Okay. On page 146, we talk about fact-finding. This is where we actually get down to, you know, gathering this information uh, without regard to the RAD and JAD tools. So, yes, uh, you're going to develop an... Uh, a technique to f identify the information that you need and you know the who what when where and why kind of a scenario so on the next page they talk about you know, the typical questions that you would ask and I'm not going to read through them all but there is one at the the top of the next page and it, it echoes almost always I mean it echoes almost exactly what I've been saying about it says what processes could be eliminated by the business process re-engineering? Remember I talked about how, you know, buying a new new computer and installing new software isn't going to save you any money at all? And in fact, buying hardware and software cost you money. The only way you really make money is when you change your business practices, typically by eliminating some business practice. Uh, eliminate a step or short circuit a step or reduce a step or something that's where you make money and so yes when you're trying to do this fact-finding you need to zero in on that one among all the lists I mean the rest of the list uh, on the page 146 and, and page 147 are pretty cool but that top one on 147 is dead on okay so um, they have the, the next one they talk about the who what when where and why and this is common sense stuff, you'd think. But again, it, it, just because it's common sense to you, don't say, oh, well, I'm going to skip that. Everyone knows this. This is dumb. No, the whole point of this is to extract information from others who might not be quite as bright as you. So you need to help them. So yes, what does the current system do? You know, <laughs> all these kinds of questions, the who, what, when, where, and why, are very, very crucial. Because again, you're trying to trying to extract, sometimes painfully, extract this information from them. So if you have a good understanding of what the current system does, uh, you can come up with some similar type of uh, questions on what the proposed system is going to do. And sometimes you can't go directly to them and ask them about the proposed system because they have no frame of reference. Uh, I got time for one goofy little story. So 10 million years ago, uh, we were putting together a, an inter enterprise resource management system, an ERP. And uh, the budget folks said, you know, I don't trust it. Could you go in and extract the, the daily data entry um, going into this new system? Because I want to compare it to our, our current system. And I said, so what do you want? And they said, yeah, the, all I want is a printout. Uh, the, the daily cost uh, data going f being fed into the new system. I went, uh, okay, well, I can do that. So, so actually, we're out of time, and I'll pick up this conversation in just a few minutes.